Welcome, folks, to the second week of Live Your Calling. What on earth am I here for? If you're in a small group, you began your first group this past week, and you learned that God says to us, I am your creator, even before, I loved you even before you were born. You were in my care even before you were born. Something like that. <laughs> Isaiah 44, 2, I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. <coughs> I hope you're as excited as I am about this all-church spiritual growth experience. You know, we did this back uh, before Easter for 40 days. Remember that was 40 days in the Word? One of the, one of the young folks in our college-age group said, was that the 40 days and 40 nights thing we did? Yeah, it was, something like that. And we had, what, 15 or 16 small groups that got started for that, and 180 people were involved in that, 180 people from our congregation. That's great. This time around, we're starting up at the end of summer, going into the fall. People are busy, distracted, and, and somebody said, yeah, I will be lucky if we get 100 people. Well, I got news for you. As of yesterday, we had 14 groups and 144 people involved in that. That's worth celebrating. That's great. You know, these small, these small group experiences help us jumpstart our faith in God, or they help us renew, rejuvenate that faith we have in God. So if you're not in a small group, you need to get into one. Still an opportunity, even after this first week. I know you can catch up. There's a self-registering table back there where you can find which groups are still open, what time, where they're meeting, and get yourself registered for that. As soon as you do that, that information will go to the office, and you'll be contacted with all that you need to know. So remember from uh, last week, there's a lot of material we're going to cover. Thanks, Scott. I could use that. Thank you. Oh, boy. I love this 1010 service, but it's, soon, it's sooner after the last two sermons than I'm used to. You know, there's a lot of material that we cover in these small groups, a lot in this one, but you know what? There's a lot to your life. If you live to be 70 years old, you'll be on this earth 25,550 days. I think it's worth an investment of 40 days to figure out what you're supposed to do with the other 25,510. Remember from last week, God's call is not just for the preachers or the missionaries or the church workers or what have you. God's call is for you. God is calling you and God has a purpose for your life and God has a purpose for us here together. To understand your life purpose, you've got to begin with, with God. Because he's the one who created you. Your creator can best show you your purpose in life. Actually, actually, it all begins in God's nature. The Bible tells us that God is love. God doesn't just have love. God doesn't just show love. God is love. Love is the character and essence of God, his very being. You know, there would be no love in the universe if it weren't for the fact that God, creator of everything, is love. And you see, God's love is not based on who you are or what you do. It's based on who he is. And the reason that you and I are able to give and to receive love is because God made us in his image. Do you get that? He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. You see, God chose you and loved you because God wanted a family. And guess what? God wants you to be in it. Circle that in that phrase. Find that uh, bulletin insert. It's the outline for this sermon. And I want you to go to the top there where you have that quote from Ephesians 1. And I want you to circle those two words. His pleasure. His pleasure. You know why? Because it gives God joy to have you in his family. 
So the first purpose that God has for creating you is this one. Drum roll, envelope please. And the first purpose is, thank you. And the first purpose is to be loved by God. Just let that one sink in. Your first purpose in life is to be loved by God. Your first purpose in life is, is not to serve God, not to trust God, not to obey God, not even to love God. The first purpose of your life is to let God love you. <clears throat> I really want you to get this one. This is so foundational. It's so important. Your first duty in life is, is, is not to do something. It's not to learn, to listen, to pray, to give, to sacrifice, or to, or to serve. These are all very good things. But they're not the first thing that God created you for. He created you to receive his love. That's the first purpose of life. This is taught through all of Scripture. One of the favorite parables we have is the par it's called the parable of the prodigal son. Some actually call it the parable of the prodigal father. Prodigal means to spend lavishly. Well, the story is about the son who received his inheritance, and he spent it all lavishly and foolishly and was destitute. But his father welcomed him back with open arms. Father lavishly spent his love on him. Favorite parable of Jesus. Why? Because it illustrates this great truth. God first made you to love you. It's throughout the scriptures. Look at the book of Jude. Anybody ever look at that book? No, you don't because you're flipping through all the books of the New Testament. It's only 25 verses long, so you miss it every time. I know it's in here someplace, but where is it? It's the last, second of the last book, right before Revelation. So when you get, find yourself in Revelation, just back up a little bit. There's the book of Jude. It starts like this. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. I want you to circle called. Remember, you are called. And circle, who are loved by God. That reminds us that we've been called to live in the love of God. I'm called into a relationship with God. By the way, this book of Jude is so interesting. That very first sentence is full of humility. Well, how is that full of humility? Because he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Jude and James were the sons of Mary and Joseph of Nazareth. James was called the brother of the Lord. So was Jude. But what does he call himself? Jude, brother of the Savior. Now listen to me. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's humility. Anyhow, we're called to be loved by God and called into a relationship. So that's the second thing that we remember from this. I'm called to enjoy a relationship with God. Because God wants you to experience his love. The number one calling in your life is not to a role. It's not to a responsibility. It's not to a bunch of rules, regulations, and rituals. It's not to religion. It's to a relationship. Christianity is not a religion, or it's not supposed to be. People try to make it into a religion. They try to make it all about rules, regulations, and rituals. But it's not about that. God sent Christ so you could have a relationship, not a religion, a relationship with God. And what kind of relationship with God does God want you to have with him? God wants you in his family. And so that means God wants you as his son or daughter. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Now the third part of this is this. 
the relationship that God created you for is to be his son or daughter. That's what God is calling you to. Receive his love, be in his family, be his son or daughter. This is the most amazing truth you will ever hear in your life. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe doesn't want you to be his slave, his servant, his soldier, but his son or his daughter, his child. God wants a family to love, and he wants you in it. Now, if you're bored by this statement, God loves you. How many of you ever heard that one before, God loves you? How many times have you heard it? How long have you heard it? If you're bored by that statement, then maybe you don't get it. Maybe you haven't experienced the fullness of God's love. Guys, it's not an ushy-mushy, romantic kind of love. It's a love of power that goes right down to the soles of your feet. If you knew that, you'd be excited by that phrase, God loves you. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I want you to get this one. Your number one calling in life is not to impress God with what you do. Your number one calling in life is to receive something to let God love you. He loves you on your good days and on your not so good days in those even really, really bad days. God loves you when you feel it and when you don't feel it. When you think you deserve it and when you don't think you deserve it, you can't make God stop loving you. God's love is wide enough to be everywhere. There is no place in the universe that God's love ends. It's in the, pop, in the bar where people are getting drunk. It's in the red light district where people are selling their bodies. It's in the barrio, the slum, the ghetto. It's even in the rich part of town where people are ignoring God. There is no place where God's love is not. You don't see it? That doesn't mean it's not there. We can't see God, but he's here and he's real. If you get on God's wavelength, you will experience his love. You may feel alone at different points in your life, but you will never, ever truly be alone. God's love is there whether you are aware of it or not, and it's wide enough to be everywhere. God's love is long enough to last forever. Human love tends to wear out, or it can wear out. Divorces, breakups, conflicts all attest to that. But God's love never wears out. God will never, ever stop loving you. Even if you choose to reject him to go and go to hell, God will still love you even there. His love is eternal. He made you and he loves you with an everlasting love. And God's love is deep enough to handle anything. No matter what pain you're going through, what problems you're facing, what hurt you've taken, God's love is deeper still. If you're in the pits, if you've hit bottom, if you can't go any lower, if you're in despair, know this. God's love goes deeper than that. God's love is high enough to overlook my sins. Because of Jesus Christ, God is able to overlook my faults, my failures, my sin, my rebellion. Because of forgiveness through the cross, we get a fresh start in life. So here's the question for you. How would your life be different? 
How would it be transformed if you began to be aware of God's unconditional, continuous, and never-ending love for you? What if, what if that truth penetrated you from the top of your head to the tip of your toes in such a way that when you woke up in the morning, it was a profound reality, and you just knew that God's love for me is wide, long, deep, and high, everlasting. How would that change your life through the day? When you get this reality, this truth, that God's love for you is deep, unconditional, and eternal, amazing things begin to happen in your life and open up. And I want to look at five good things that come into your life when you accept God's love in that profound manner. So let's take a look at them. First thing that begins to happen in your life is, I feel accepted rather than ashamed. Do you know how many people go through their entire life avoiding God? And by the way, some of those folks who are avoiding God are in church. What better place to avoid God than in church, because you can tell yourself and your family and everybody else around you, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in with God. I go to church. But a lot of people really spend their entire lives avoiding God because they're ashamed. They feel guilty about something. They feel under condemnation. They feel judged. And they think, God is perfect and I am not. So why in the world would I want to hang out with a perfect God who's simply going to remind me of all the ways that I've failed? Here's why. Because that's not what God does. Jesus said, For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The Bible also says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the no condemnation lifestyle. You want to hear it? Maybe it's one that you would want to enter into. It's this. You're set free to accept God's love and free from the addiction to have the approval of others. When God loves you unconditionally, you don't need other people's approval to be happy. You know, when people criticize me, I may learn something valuable from them. Or not. It all depends. But when people personally attack me or impugn my character, you know what? I can laugh it off. You see, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And whether you like me or not, it's not really relevant to my happiness because I'm not looking for your love and approval. I'm receiving the love that I don't really deserve, that love that comes from God. Second thing that begins to happen when you receive that love that comes from God is this, I am bold to bring my needs to God. We can be bold in our prayers because we're sons and daughters of the living God. Remember, we're called to be in his family, his children. We can ask him stuff. You know, when my kids were little, they would come to me and they'd ask me anything and tell me what they needed or what they wanted. They assumed that I had everything, knew everything, and could afford everything. Well, you and I know that's not true about me. But with God, it is true. Romans chapter 8 tells us, All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you should not be cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children, adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. Now, I looked this passage up in my Greek New Testament in the original language of the Bible, and it says there, calling him Abba, Father. It's like saying, calling him Daddy, or Papa, or Dad. The Bible tells us that when you come to God in prayer, you approach him as your loving 
Dad. As a matter of fact, you know, we say the Lord's Prayer a lot, don't we? And how does that start? Our Father who art in heaven. Actually, when Jesus taught it to the disciples, he says, pray like this, Abba, Father. See, it's that relationship thing again. We can approach him as a loving dad. You know, if my kids had come to me when they needed money and they said, Oh, thou most gracious progenitor of the Thompson family, thou wonderful observer and keeper of all the family funds. I'd go, say what? <laughs> Rather, this is how they come to me. Dad, I need some money. When my daughter would call when she was away at college and call and ask the top talk to mom, it was all about roommates, relationships, classes, what have you. Then she'd say, Mom, can I talk to Dad? Then it was about, Dad, I need some money. Straightforward, right to the point, bold. You know what? We can be bold, straightforward, and bringing our requests to God because he's already told us, I want you in my family. I'm your Abba, your Dad, your Papa. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We can ask anything in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father doesn't say, well, okay, I'll pencil you in for next Thursday. No, he answers the phone. He listens now. It's like when you get that important phone call, you want to pick it up right away. That's how God responds to us. So let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can be bold in praying our needs to God. The third thing that begins to happen in our life when we receive, accept that powerful love of God is this. I have peace in pain I don't understand. Now you're going to have a lot of things that happen in your life that you don't understand or you don't deserve. And you're going to ask, God, why is this happening to me? Now, I know some of you have been saying for quite some time, God, why is it always happening to me? And you're going to look out on the world and say, God, why are these things happening in the world? A couple of, couple of truths here. The first truth is this. God does not owe us an explanation. The second truth is this. Not everything that happens in your life or in this world is God's will. God hates evil. And there's a lot of evil done in this world. And God could easily take away all the evil. Very simple. Take away our freedom as humans to do it. He could easily get rid of all the suffering in the world by taking away your choice and my choice and turn us all into puppets. But here's the deal. God created us to love us, and he wants a genuine love. And that genuine love means voluntarily loving him back. And so he puts it, look at you can't make somebody love you. To be loved, it has to be coming voluntarily from that person. So God puts up with a lot of pain and evil in order to give us the freedom of that choice to love him and not be puppets or robots. So here's another truth. What you really need is not an explanation. You need a presence. The presence of God in your life. That's how people can go through suffering and pain. That's how people can remain calm in the storm. They have the presence of God, God's love, that passes understanding. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's when you feel at peace even when you don't get what's going on. I may know why this is, I may not know why this is happening, but I do know this, that God is good and he loves me and he wants best for my life. 
Last week, we looked at this great promise in the Bible, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I'm going to ask you, just like last week, I'm going to ask you to circle that word called and circle that word purpose and draw a line to connect those two circles. Why? Because calling and purpose go together. God has called those who have call, been called by him. God calls those purpose, people for his purpose and works for their good. God's love does not exempt us from pain or suffering in this life. But because I know that God's got my back, I can trust God even in those bad moments when things aren't going well at all. Fourth thing that begins to happen in our lives when we let the love of God sink into us. I gain courage to take risks. Maybe you've noticed, when somebody believes in you, it gives you the courage to accomplish all kinds of things you never thought you could do. Because they believe in you, you are encouraged. You know, I grew up in a family with a grandfather who was a master carpenter. When he was a young man, he did the finish work on the Pullman cars on the railroads in Missouri. They used oak lumber to build those seats and those um, luggage racks and all the railings and everything. He was the finish carpenter for those things. With hand, no power tools, no laser levels, <laughs> all hand tools and measured by hand. He was a master carpenter. My dad was pretty good, pretty good as a carpenter. Me, I kind of putter along. But as a child, I remember some projects that I started and I messed up. You know, I cut that board again and it's still too short. I don't get it. I messed up some stuff. My dad would come out in the garage and say, what are you doing? And I was ashamed. And he'd say, that's okay. You know, we can fix this up. We can replace this, or we can start over. It's okay. You notice he said, we can do that. And that gave me the courage to try it again, knowing that he'd be there to help me. Well, that's the very same thing your Heavenly Father is saying to you today. He's saying, you may have really messed up. Maybe you're disappointed in your life, but it's okay. Let's get at it. We'll do this thing together. One plus God is a done deal. I don't care if you're 15 or 50 or 95. It's not too late for you to give it another shot. And with God, you can't miss. Now, for some of you, God has been waiting for this moment your entire life. You've spent your entire life afraid to surrender yourself totally to God because you don't know how much he really loves you. Friends, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And when love comes in the front door of your life, fear is going to go out the back door. And when fear departs, you really get moving in life. Nobody knows better than God your true purpose in life, and God is perfect love. So this is your moment this morning. Don't be afraid. Accept his love, call on him in prayer, and the fear will drain out of your life. Now, if you're not sure how to do this, I want you to see me after the service and say, Pastor Richard, I want fear to drain out of my life. I'm not sure how to get at it. Pastor Richard, what's this about surrendering myself to, to God? Can you help me? Ask me. I really want you to come to me, and I want to pray with you. I want to go to the fifth thing now. Lastly, when I become aware of how deeply God loves me, I can worship instead of worry. Now, this is really a good one for me. This is a big one for me because I come from a long and distinguished line of worriers. I can tell you stories. And it's been passed on to me, and I'm still working with God's help on getting past that. 
Worship, you see, is the antidote to worry. Worship is simply expressing my love to God. And you know what? You could do that anywhere, anytime. Inside the church, outside the church. Driving in the car, walking, whatever. Worship is a response to God because God first loved us. Now, when you worry, you're acting like an orphan. You've forgotten how much God loves you and that he wants you in his family. He's adopted you as his son or daughter when you worry. So either you're going to worry or you're going to worship. Either you're going to look at your problems or you're going to look at God. Had a woman in my last church who used to say, if you're going to worry, why pray? And if you're going to pray, why worry? You're going to look at your problems or you're going to look at God. Jesus said this, don't worry about having a, enough food or drink or clothing. He'll give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That's the heart of God's promise right there. And that's why we're doing this series, What on Earth Am I Here For? God cares about you, and His love for you is unshakable. So you don't want to miss any of the next four weeks, none at all. The next four callings that we're going to talk about all flow from this one, the foundational one, letting God love you. That's your first purpose in life, to let God love you. And all that we're doing in this whole series about my purpose here flows out of God's love for us. Not out of duty, not out of good, uh, out of guilt, not out of pleasure, but out of God loving you and me. You know, it's not too late to get into one of those small groups where we're going to cover all this stuff in depth. Those small groups just got started this week. I know you can easily catch up. I'm encouraging you. I have confidence in you that you can catch up. In a small group, you'll find the heart of what we're studying here together. God loves you with an unshakable love. Now, this week in your small groups, you're going to learn another memory verse. It's pretty easy. It's from Romans 6, 13. It goes like this. Give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life. Can you say it with me? Romans 6, 13. Give yourselves to God to God, since you have been given new life. Romans 6, 13. I'm going to have to do that one over again because I let my mind wander and I, I messed it up. Romans 6, 13 goes like this. Give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life. 